So welcome to this evening's event, which is the last event of the Edmund J. Safra's Center for Study of Ethics series this year on institutional corruption. My name is Lawrence Lessig. I'm the director of the center and a professor here at the law school. And I'm very happy this evening to welcome Professor Malcolm Salter and uh, Paul Volker to the law school for a conversation that's certain to draw together uh, the issues that we've been talking about uh, for the past two years with the work that Mr. Volker and Professor Salker, uh, Salter have been working on for at least the past two score years. Um, Malcolm Salter is the James J. Hill Professor of Business Administration Emeritus at the Business School. He's been at the Business School since 1967, working and teaching in the areas of corporate strategy, organization, and governance. He's a trustee and a director of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and is an overseer of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. For a time, he was the chair of Newton's Citizen Advocacy Advisory Group, charged with developing a new financial management model for the city. Now, I came to know Mal Salter after reading his incredible book, Innovation Corrupted, which tells the story of Enron's collapse in a way that complements directly the approach that we have taken to the issue of corruption at the center generally. Put most simply, that the most interesting questions in that collapse and across the work that we study are not actually the instances of criminal behavior. They were instead the issues of normal behavior and how that behavior led that institution to lose touch with its values or the values of the society within which it was to operate. And since the launch of our product project at the center, Mal has competed with Dr. David Korn to be the most regular participant in our weekly seminars. He's been an enormous asset to everyone uh, as he occupies and openly and proudly declares that he is the resident capitalist in our midst. <laughs> Helps us all to see what those trained across the river seem to see so clearly and we've learned a great deal from his questions as well as his writing and I'm grateful for him taking the lead in the conversation this evening. That conversation will be with Paul Volcker. Mr. Volcker is a Princeton and a Harvard-educated economist. He began his career with the New York Fed uh, um, and began between 1957 and 1975. He held a series of positions at the Chase Bank and at the U.S. Treasury. 1974, he became the president of the New York Fed and in 1979, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Mr. Volcker was appointed chairman to the Fed by President Carter and he quickly became the most important figure in the then existing financial crisis. Now that crisis was my first financial crisis. I uh, kind of remember it in, uh, in, in a profound personal way because of how it affected my own family. And as he wrestled inflation to the ground, some would say literally, by which they mean figuratively, so I will just leave the adverb off there, Mr. Volcker became something of a hero in my family as well, not that his actions made us any better off. Indeed, in the short term, they made things much worse off. Um, but there was an integrity and a competence that for a brief moment gave us confidence. Here was a technically trained employee of the government who took an enormously difficult problem. Inflation in 1981 was 13.5%. The prime rate was 21.5%. And with very few smiles, he dealt with it and dealt with it effectively. By 1983, inflation had dropped to 3.5%. Reagan reappointed Mr. Volcker, and by the end of his second term, the prime was at about 6%. Now, I remember thinking at this time, the budding cynic that I was, that I didn't actually know this was possible. A government employee leading a project to take on a critical national issue and actually solving it. Uh, I checked on Google, it happened three other times in the history of the United States, that's it. But here was one of the most important recent times that that happened. Now, after leaving the Fed in 1987, Mr. Volcker became chairman of the investment bank, J. Rothschild, Wolfenson and Company. And over the last 25 years, he has been drafted to an endless list of causes that each needed a respected leader with integrity, from the Volcker Commission, which considered dormant Jewish accounts in Swiss banks, to the UN, which needed a review of the corruption in the, or the alleged corruption in the Iraqi oil for food program, 
to the Obama administration, which needed a chair for an economic recovery advisory board, and his work with that administration helped birth what's been called the Volcker Rule, Volcker Rule, which will prevent commercial banks from owning and investing in hedge funds and private equity and limited trading that they do for their own account. And I'm sure about that rule we will hear a great deal more tonight. But again, on behalf of the center, I want to thank both Mal and Mr. Volker for helping us understand these issues, especially here in the law school where it's very difficult for us to understand these issues. And I'd like to ask everyone to join me in welcoming them both to this conversation this evening. Thank you. Is my, my, my mic is on. You can hear me. Uh, uh, thank you, Larry, for the in, introduction of both of us. I just want to set the record straight on, on one count. Uh, I am a professor emeritus. Many of you might not know what emeritus means. Uh, for those of you who had four years of Latin, as I did, please forget all your Latin. What emeritus basically means is without merit and without paycheck. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of where I am today. Uh, we thought we'd have a discussion uh, between us for 40 minutes or so, and then uh, we want to really have a dialogue. There are lots of people uh, in, the, in the room uh, who are interested in, in chatting with Mr. Volker directly, and we want to make that happen. But I thought I would start out just with a brief introductory comment, and then I want to uh, sort of launch into it. Uh, the discussion of the implementation of financial reform, I think, is a, provides a wonderful window on the current state of financial capitalism uh, in the nation today and the politics that surround it. Uh, for sure, we are facing a very complex rulemaking and, uh, and regulatory challenge. And some of that was summarized in the memo that went out with the invitation. But the ruckus over the Volcker rule, uh, for me, is a riveting act in a much broader drama about conflicting economic values and competing vision of what can constitutes effective economic governance, at least as it relates to the finance, to the finance industry. So having said, uh, having said that, it seems to me that there are at least seven uh, interesting agenda items for us to touch on at the beginning, or not. But uh, I just want to tick these off uh, briefly. Uh, one, I think historical context is really important, and I am going to start uh, there. Uh, another agenda item, I think, is the Volcker vision. What is the Volcker vision? Uh, the Volcker vision actually is quite simple, I think. It's not quite this. <laughs> this, is the, this is the proposed rule from FSOC, Financial Stability Oversight Council, and its constituency regulatory agencies that was issued in October. This is just the rules and commentary on section 619. What's the vision? Okay. What's the vision? I'm so excited I'm spilling the water already, which I always do. Uh, so that, I think, is really important uh, to keep in mind. What is that vision? Then there's the problem of, of, of gaming this framework of financial reform. Will banks try to sidestep the rules of the game through lawful maneuvers? Is there any evidence of that? If so, do we do anything about it? Do we care? And do we do anything about it? In addition to gaming or right flowing from gaming is the question of the regulatory architecture. There's some very interesting issues there to, expo to, to, uh, to explore. I'm also going to, uh, there's also an issue, and here I'm channeling. I'm channeling from my friends on Wall Street. Uh, I'm ch there are perceived inconsistencies in the, uh, in the vocal rule. And in the common language of my banker friends, it's called, they challenge the integrity, not the honesty, but the integrity in a design, in a design sense uh, of, the, of, of the rule. There is international outcry over the Volcker rule, which needs to uh, uh, have some attention paid to it. 
And then finally, the seventh is the bank lobbying and the future of uh, the Volcker uh, rule. The real question, not to parse it too, uh, too, uh, too, too, too carefully, is, is the proposed rule on a death march? So there's some very important issues here. Now, I recognize that from years of experience that you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I have been told this is especially true for very tall horses. So I expect to, uh, I expect to uh, ask some questions, and I think uh, Mr. Volker will, will, in his wisdom, move in the direction that he wants to go, and that will just be fine. To start things off, uh, uh, to give some historical context, I want to go back to a truly remarkable talk that Mr. Volker gave, uh, April 8th, 2008, at the Economic Club of New York. Bear Stearns was collapsing. This, if there ever was the fog of war, this was going on. And Mr. Volker was asked to give a talk. And I want to read a couple of paragraphs from it and then ask one or two questions, to, a reflection on that. Because uh, it's, a, uh, it's really a very trenchant piece. And I'm quoting. Until the New York crisis, the country had been free from any sense of financial crisis for more than 40 years. In contrast, today's financial crisis is the culmination of at least five serious breakdowns of systematic significance in the past 25 years, on average one every five years warning enough that something rather basic is amiss. He continues, over that time, we have moved from a commercial bank-centered, highly regulated financial system to an enormously more complicated, highly engineered system. Today, most of the financial intermediation takes place in markets beyond the effective oversight and supervision, uh, and uh, all enveloped in unknown trillions of derivative instruments. It has been a highly profitable business with finance uh, uh, accounting now or recently for 35 to 40% of all corporate profits. It's hard to argue that the new system has brought exceptional benefits to the economy generally. Economic growth and productivity in the last 25 years has been comparable to that of the 50s and the 60s. But in the earlier years, the prosperity was more widely shared. Just a few more words. In sheer, the sheer complexity, opaqueness, and systematic risks embedded in the new markets has enormously complicated both official and private, that means business, uh, responses to this uh, current mother of all crises. E even previously normal trading relationships among long established institutions are questions. What has plainly been at risk is a disorderly unraveling of the mutual trust among respected market participants upon which any strong and efficient financial system must rest. We at the Senate talk a lot about trust. Simply stated, the, the, the bright new financial system for all its talented participants and for all its rich rewards has failed the test of the marketplace. So that's a pretty straight shooting, clear, Unopaque that statement. A, that was a brilliant report. What those brilliant, brilliant remarks? Should I continue? <laughs> <laughs> and so the questions, and where I thought we would we would start is, so, what were those serious breakdowns that you were referring to since the 1980s? How related were these breakdowns to changes in the regulatory architecture? And how do you see? And this is the most important question. How do you see Dodd Frank and the Volcker Rule in particular? increasing the probabilities of avoiding future financial breakdowns, such as the one that we were seeing in 2008 and 9. I came here on the supposition I didn't have to give a speech. So you would ask so many questions, how can I answer it short of a Just speech? Just let it go. <laughs> Look, I've got to make one comment I can't resist in this great intellectual center of Harvard and you, and emeritus professor, and all the emoluments you don't get as an emeritus professor. I want it known that I'm an emeritus professor too at Princeton. I want to Princeton. I don't know whether you mentioned that. I, I retract what I just said about emeriti. Well, I, <laughs> a couple of years after I stopped, I got busy. I got a nice embossed letter from the trustees of Princeton University that said the trustees had decided in their wisdom to give me emeritus status. 
This was some years after I stopped here. I thought that was very nice. Uh, a few days later, I got another letter. and said, you must understand that emeritus status did not permit you to park in the Princeton campus, <laughs> which I thought put these things in the right... Uh... Parking is important. <laughs> right. Parking <laughs> permits are important. Well, look, I, uh, I think it's true what I said then. We did, had a great financial shock, a great economic shock, obviously, in 1929, the ensuing years. And we had quite a lot of regulation which ensued from that, and it made a profound impact on people's behavior for a couple of decades. Uh, you didn't worry about people taking excessive risks. Uh, in the 1940s, 1950s, even into the 1960s. But there is a conception that, as was brilliantly articulated uh, by a professor in the 70s and 80s, that success and stability will bring its own downfall. Because uh, the guy's name was Minsky. And the you know, more confident you are that things are in good shape, the more risk you will take. And sooner or later, the culmination of risk will produce a excessive markets in one direction or another, and you'll have a breakdown, and the process will start all over again. People will feel very safe for a while, and the markets will get uh, settled down until you have the next crisis. Well, that was happening with great rapidity, actually, in the... Uh, it began in the 70s, but then in the 80s, uh, we had a great crisis at the time. Shortly after I became chairman of the Federal Reserve, known as the Latin American Debt Crisis. Now, people have kind of forgotten about that. It's a generation ago, and you don't learn about those things a generation uh, ago, wherever you are, unless you really look in the history books. But that... Uh, was a concentrated question about sovereign debt uh, located in Latin America. Sound familiar? Sovereign debt. Where the principal banks in the United States, then relatively smaller, but there were more of them, uh, had capital committed to Latin America and other developing countries that was in excess, had loans committed in excess of their own capital. And when Mexico was the first to announce they weren't able to pay their debts, and this spread in a contagious way through the rest of Latin America, the whole banking system, of the big banks in the United States was jeopardized, and it was true of big banks elsewhere in the world. So that was a pretty considerable crisis, but it was more manageable than we had now because it was a banking crisis. And you did have a certain degree of control and protection, not just control, but banks could borrow from the Federal Reserve. Banks had their deposits insured by the FDIC. And there was a sense that the government, rightly or wrongly, would protect them. And with a lot of floundering around, we got through that crisis. But the rest of the world outside of banks was not that, were indirectly affected, but it was not, it wasn't a failure of non-banks that was at issue here. Well, that had changed by uh, 2008, when the crisis broke said that a large part of the financial system and the initial strains fell on the non-banks. At that time, right at the time of that speech, was uh, Bear Stearns. And that was taken care of by truly extraordinary measures. Uh, the Federal Reserve took occasion to, directly or indirectly, lend money in a way that required use of emergency authority that had never really been used, emergency authority that was propounded in the early 1930s and said in, in uh, God, I used to know this language by heart, and uh, I forgot about the language, very unusual circumstances, the Federal Reserve may lend to non-banks. Never used the authority, never wanted to use the authority, because knew that once we did that, Can't go back. you couldn't resist the next request. So the line was held very strongly, only can lend to banks. Well, that was violated, not illegally, but as I said in the speech, it really stretched the law, uh, to rescue the situation for Bear Stearns and permitted the big bank, Morgan, to take it over. And that settled things for a while, but only for a while, and a year later, uh, it all came tumbling down in 2008. Uh, 
First of all, you had Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac coming under pressure. The government had to take it over directly without any particular authority, but they went ahead and did it. Uh, rightly, and not exactly. Uh, then you had uh, pressures went to Lehman first, I guess. It's hard to remember. The feeling, look, we've done enough of this bailing out. Let this one go, right? And I'm simplifying a bit. They let it go, and that was wildfire through the rest of the interconnected financial system. And what we found out is this modern financial system, not entirely, but much more outside the banking system, uh, was on the brink of, well, failed. I don't think it wasn't on the brink of failure, it failed. It took hundreds of billions of dollars of government money in the United States and elsewhere to protect non-banking institutions. And it was interesting that this new financial system that arose with vaunted efficiency, celebrated by the relative lack of regulation and government support, considered to be efficient, steered by rational expectations, filled with highly mathematical algorithms and procedures, taught by all the best institutions in the United States, including Harvard and Princeton and Yale, the whole profession of financial engineering arose. And the system was considered fail-safe. After all, we had derivatives, which took care of every possible uh, risk that might arise in this market. And to give you some idea of the complexity, something called the credit default swaps, which I'm sure you've heard of, a form of so-called derivatives, was invented in the late 1990s. Invented, didn't exist before. And what this was was a kind of insurance policy that you developed a market to take care of the risk of a particular loan. You could buy in what was amounted to insurance and somebody would sell you the insurance, they would take all the risk of a default, and you would pay them a little money over the next the length of the loan. So with this protection, the markets, non-bank markets, expanded even faster. By the time the crisis broke, just interesting indication of the complexity of this, there was $60 trillion worth of credit default swaps that had only been invented 10 years earlier, outstanding $60 trillion, protecting about $6 trillion of credits. And you ask, you know, how do you have insurance policies of $60 trillion to protect $6 billion, $6 trillion? Today, I'm told, just we haven't gotten rid of all this, take all the derivatives that exist, including credit default swaps, which are now less than $6 trillion, $60 trillion, there are 700 trillion derivatives outstanding today of all sorts. And these are all methods of betting on future transactions of one sort or another. Now the total GDP of the world is, I don't know, 50 trillion or something. I guess a little more than that. 700 trillion uh, derivatives outstanding. So we have a much more complex world than we thought we had. Now this is a long way around to get to the answer to your question. When the crisis broke in full fury in that great week in 2008, what happened? You had five big investment banks, major financial institutions, all American born and bred, but international in scope, in 2008. 2000, Bear Stearns had already gone, 2007. In one week, Lehman went bankrupt. AIG was suddenly realized to be in deep trouble because they had a lot of credit default swaps, which they could not satisfactorily convince anybody they had enough capital to deal with. The government stepped in on Whoever thought that the biggest insurance company in the world was in jeopardy because of a financial instrument that had only been invented 10 years earlier. Merrill Lynch had a quick marriage with the Bank of America. 
So Bear Stearns is gone, Lehman is gone, Merrill Lynch is gone, who's next? Uh, Morgan Stanley. They were given a bank license. Isn't it interesting? They were given a bank license. Goldman too. And then the biggest totem of all, Goldman Gold. Sachs said, we want a bank license too. Why did they want a banking license? They wanted a banking license to be protected. The feeling they were available, mother would take care of them. Mother is an unfamiliar name for the Federal Reserve, but that's what they had in mind. That they could borrow from the Federal Reserve when nobody else was willing to lend to them. And the FDIC would step in and guarantee some of their deposits, deposits and access to credit. And in any event, the government was likely to take, the crisis was so great, the government would take other extraordinary action to protect them, as they did. In ensuing weeks, they had this great talk and got congressional authorization to lend $700, $800 billion, whatever it was. So after a week of crisis, not one independent investment bank that every smart young graduate of Harvard wanted to go join because that was the place to make money and have a great time in these new modern financial markets. Every one of them had even disappeared to become a bank, a stodgy old bank. Now I say, to get to your point, there is some reality to the fact, fact that banks take risks, all right? Banks are essential to the financial system. They do old-fashioned things that they were doing in 1980 and 1880 all over the world. They make loans. If you're a, particularly a small and medium-sized business, you don't have any place else to go, basically, except the banks. They take care of your deposits. They provide a safe place to put money, and in most places it's guaranteed one way or another. And they run the payment system, which people take for granted, but economies can't survive without ways of moving money, not just from your checkbook to somebody else's, but move it around the world for the biggest companies. International trade cannot survive without a payment system. That's the role of banks. That's why they've been protected. And that's why in that frightening week in 2008, everybody wanted to become a bank. Everybody, naming these big financial institutions. But I would argue, okay, there's a price for that. The banks are essential. They do have access to government support. As a result, they are indirectly subsidized. There isn't any question today that banks can borrow at a cheaper rate than a non-bank can borrow in the money market because there's a sense they're protected by the government. If that's all true, they ought to pay attention to their fundamental business and not get involved in all the activities that drove us over the cliff in the first decade of this century. So in a sense, that's what it's, it's all about. That's all about what Dodd-Frank is about. Now, it's unfair when you list all this thing. Half of all those pages are questions they put out. That's right, 35 out of the 280 actually are the rules. Yes, it and, is. And then the rest of it is all questions that uh, the FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, is posing to the industry to comment on. Yeah. Those comment letters came back on February 13th. But to this point... I like to go, just in yeah. respect to that rule, I like to, a few days after all this criticism about the length of the rule, I had to pay my insurance policy on my home. It's not very complicated, not that big a home. I looked through the insurance policy, that was 35 pages long <laughs> of incomprehensible what's included, what's not included, right. under what circumstances will we pay, will not pay, and right. so forth and so on. So. Yeah, well, we have sympathy uh, uh, on, on, that, on that score. But your vision was really quite simple, as I, as I recall. Uh, the, the idea is, uh, and, and, and good ideas are simple. One, that these new banks, these uh, old banks and the or new the banks. the old banks. The yeah, banks. And, the, and, the, and, the old, and the old banks. Uh, cannot use, uh, cannot basically uh, uh, trade for their own account, uh, generally speaking, with a lot of exceptions, 
Uh, certainly the ones that are federally, uh, are federally guaranteed banks, depository institutions, cannot do that. Uh, and, that uh, and that they were prohibited from investing maximum of 3% in the startup and in the ownership of certain uh, uh, private equity funds and hedge funds. And there were also notions of trying to, to limit uh, uh, conflicts of interest, which were basically entered into the Volcker Rule uh, when it, through Congress, uh, basically uh, the Merkley and Levin uh, initiative there. Now that's fairly simple. I mean, there's really three ideas. I think you and I could probably get that down to a piece of paper. Uh, now it has exploded. I did without your help. I, I know you did. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> uh, and by the way, just to just to let you know, uh, Mr. Volker's letter, comment letter, to the uh, to the uh, fi uh, Financial Stability Oversight Council was uh, eight pages. It was a very short page, as opposed to sixty-five uh, from and then one hundred and sixty-five from the from the from the industry associations. But if it's so simple, what's the debate? Uh, I, I, I noticed that a couple of weeks ago, the Atlantic organized uh, a conference, a summit, an economic summit in Washington. And, uh, and the program included uh, a whole host of policy practitioners and supposedly innovative thinkers uh, from across the, the spectrum. And I was, I was really interested in kind of what went on you know, at that meeting. Uh, because besides yourself at that meeting, there were, there were former secret, uh, Treasury secretaries, uh, Bob Rubin and, and Larry Summers. There was the former presidential economic advisors, Laura Tyson and Lawrence, uh, and Lawrence Lindsay. There was the former McCain campaign economic advisor, Douglas Hulse Eakin. There was the current presidential advisor, Gene Sperley. Sperley, there were people from the Fed, and there were economists, Alan Meltzer and the rest. Can you, and they were talking about basically uh, the US economy, and they were talking a lot about this kind of financial reform. Was there consensus, or was there divergent views there? Well, and if, I, there was, if there was a lack of consensus, what was it about? All I can tell you, I didn't stay for the afternoon, so I can't tell you all about that. All I know is when I walked off the podium, Bob Rubin, which was following me, reached the podium, and I only heard him say, as I left the room, that I agree with everything Mr. Volker said. <laughs> well, that doesn't seem very controversial. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he was there to hear everything I had to say. But, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but let me, uh, you know, and there's this, there is a fair amount of consensus, uh, more consensus than appears on the surface, I think, uh, in this area. Let me re return to the length of the resolution, uh, uh, the regulation, and so forth, because there's an important issue involved here, and I don't know whether we can resolve it here or elsewhere. And it's not just about this. It's just an example of an important issue. Glass-Steagall, which the bill and the law introduced after the 1929 crisis, dealt with this problem right. in one sentence. It said a bank may take an order for a customer to buy or sell a security, but at no point can that security be on the books of the bank. That's a pretty simple rule. There was no regulation. Regulation wasn't so common then. And, you know, everybody kind of saluted and said that's a clear law. Now things aren't so clear now, and we tried to be more sophisticated. But what's at issue here? This Trading in the banks, trading in the market, obviously gets very complicated. There are all kinds of instruments, there are all kinds of people participating. And we say, okay, you can trade for your customer, and you may hold the security as part of your trading position, but you've really got to be dealing with customers. That's the distinction we want. You shouldn't be dealing and speculating on your own account. Now, that sounds simple when you say it, but they say, oh, well, it's very hard to tell in practice. Can we rely in any sense on a statement of the general principle involved and expect true but verify, trust but verify, and get effective administration of the law? Now, typically in the United States, not just here, but everywhere, they say, no, no, we want a specific rule for every possible transaction we can think of. 
And let me, you know, you think of things of your own experience. When I became chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, there was a lot of complaints, there had been a lot of complaints about something called the Truth in Lending Regulation. Mm -hmm. The Federal Reserve was in charge of specifying how you told, how you described interest rates and consumer credit. And there are many different ways of describing it, so they laid down the rules of what would be acceptable and what was not, presumably not to confuse the public. And as I recall, that regulation grew to 170 pages. And I said, look, we in our wisdom ought to be able to write a rule in less than 170 pages. Go write the rule in 100 pages. Staff told me that can't be done. I said, well, you go do it anyway. And they eventually came up with a 100-page rule. We put it out for comment. What struck me is every comment we got on that roll was to increase the number of pages. And they were all from banks saying, you haven't taken care of this particular situation that I have in mind, and I want you to be very clear so that we know whether we're within the law or not within the law, or within the regulation. So translate that to this much more complicated situation of saying you can deal with the customer, but you shouldn't be dealing in your own account. Now, there's one way of handling this, which I keep trying to cite here. Let's make it clear what the principle is, which is, you know, it's reasonably clear and describable. Let's make sure the management understands what the law's intent is. Let's make sure the management in their own control systems, which they all have over their trading, departments in great detail, day by day. Let's make sure their internal control rules reflect the fact they're not supposed to be doing proprietary trading. And then let's make sure they keep statistical track of what's going on, which they do anyway, and report that to the regulators. And will this give enough evidence to the regulators to discern whether there's a pattern of so-called proprietary trading, or does it legitimately fall within the context of market making and customer trading? And there's such things, how much volatility is there? There isn't going to be much volatility in ups and downs of earnings if it's all customer trading. There's going to be a lot if you take some proprietary trade, either up or if it's a bad bet, down. What is the volume compared to the inventory you're holding? You're holding a big inventory, very little volume. You know, it obviously raises a question. Is the inventory all on the long side or you've got some on the short side too, which you would expect as a result of trading? And I think it's pretty clear that patterns would arise. It's not going to catch every transaction, but you can enforce the principle. If you see evidence in the statistics that things are going wrong, then you go to the management and say, what's going on here? And let me look at the trading books in some detail. But if there's nothing seems out of line, you don't right. do that. Just for those who, who don't run in the industry to know, one of the things that's interesting about the uh, market making and trading is that the shares, millions and millions of shares which are traded daily, are not tagged in inventory. Not, it's not like it's not like There's Amazon no where everything right? where everything is tagged and you know in fact you don't know whether it's whether it's for your own account or whether it is for market making there's not an inventory control system and there are millions and millions of shares being uh, traded out there so it's an, it's 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 possible but it's a non-trivial exercise you know to, uh, to to put in the the metrics that uh, that the chairman is talking about on this score, though, one of the things that strikes me is that, yes, even when you were at the Fed, the rules proliferated, the length proliferated. And of course, the more rules that you get and the more sub-rules you get, the more opportunity it is to game, let alone the fact that many banks don't even want to be under the regime because it may interfere with their profitability one way or another. If I can get you to comment just on, on one aspect of, of gaming, there are many. But let me give you one simple one. Uh, uh, as, as, as some of you in the room know, the Deutsche Bank, which is a German bank, and Barclays Bank, which is a US-based uh, multinational bank, 
both changed their legal structure. They did the reverse of Goldman. They did the reverse of Morgan Stanley. And uh, they, they, they were changed the legal structure of their huge uh, US subsidiaries to shield it from the new Dodd-Frank uh, regulations, which would have required both banks to pump in, and I think actually appropriately so, uh, more capital to, you know, to deal with the, uh, the, the risk. And just so you know the details of this, the Deutsche Bank basically uh, moved its large trust company outside of, uh, of its previous US operations. And as a result, neither bank uh, is classified as a bank holding company, is now out from under the jurisdiction of both Dodd-Frank and the, and, and the Volcker uh, rule. So I, I'm interested from your point of view how you would uh, view or characterize this uh, maneuver. Uh, is it a normal, in your view, a normal adaptation to change circumstance? Is it an attempt to subvert the intent of financial reform legislation? Or it is it simply a cagey move uh, uh, with no foul uh, 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 attached? Well, I'm inclined to say all of the above. But <laughs> look, I know nothing about this except what I read in the newspaper. Yep. I don't think, just to make clear, I don't think anything that they did affects the so-called Volcker rule. It apparently affects uh, the capital rule. Capital rules, right? Which is a different proposition. Uh, but you know, the same. Sure, it's an attempt to get around the capital rules as they see it. But this is the same problem that probably the most what most people think is the most important reform after the crisis is the capital rules. And capital, they say, okay, we got to really review the capital rules of the banks, and let's put some capital rules on the non-banks, the big important institutions. <laughs> there aren't so many of those left. They all become banks. All the big investment banks are gone. But the most important single thing we can do is capital rules. Now, in some ways, that's pretty simple because everybody understands these institutions need capital. There's no dispute over the purpose of the thing. It's also interesting because, by and large, capital rules do not require legislation. They're within the province of all the individual countries, and there's a recognition they should be reasonably uniform internationally. So everybody understands they all got to get together in Basel, the regulators get together, come up with a common state of capital rules that we can apply banks all over the world. Simple, huh? The regulators struggled over capital rules right through the 1990s and into the, this century without ever coming to a conclusion that was accepted by banks around the country, around the world, including the United States, most of all. And as that incomplete process went on, you had to break down, and they said, we've got to start all over again. No sooner than they started all over again, they got out a preliminary set of rules, the banks say, well, we don't like this one, particularly. Uh, we're going to go to our government and get relief from this particular rule. And then, of course, the other banks say, well, look, they're going to get relief. We want some relief. Now, what happened to the earlier capital rules? They had two big holes. They had lots of problems. But they had two particularly big holes in them, mainly because of political pressures. The capital rules against mortgages were either very low or, in some cases, almost non-existent. Everybody said, well, everybody likes banks to make mortgages, and we don't want a big capital requirement. We want them to make mortgages. Well, they made mortgages until they came out of your gazoo. Uh, and the other one was, what do you do with sovereign countries? Let's go back to the Volcker room. We sat there, and everybody says, we're not going to put capital on our own securities. I mean, what are you talking about? Our own securities are perfectly safe. But obviously, we don't, in those days, we don't want to take, a, certainly if some bank holds Zambian debt, you want a capital rule. Or maybe, you know, even if they had Greece debt, you might want a capital rule. Or Hungarian debt, you might want a capital rule. But are we going to distinguish between Greece and Portugal 
or between Hungary and Estonia, or for that matter, um, between France and Germany. Uh, so everybody backed off and said, okay, we won't have a, this is 10 years ago, we won't have a role on sovereign debt. So what do we have in the crisis? We got mortgage crisis and sovereign debt crisis. Right. Uh, two unresolved capital <laughs> protection issues. And what could be simple than putting on capital controls and right here you got a big problem. And you don't have to be so esoteric or so easy as those. What do you do with plain, ordinary commercial loans? The argument always be back when I was there when we first put these things on. Should General Motors have the same capital requirement, loan to General Motors have the same capital requirement as some new start, start up in Yakima, Washington? And obviously, well, no, I mean, I guess we don't want the same capital requirement on General Motors as we do on some unknown company in a small town. Well, which gave the biggest process, problem when you had a crisis with General Motors or Ford or Chrysler? I mean, these judgments are extremely difficult to make. And they are all pressured strongly by lobbying, political pressures of various sorts. So this whole process is very difficult. So let me come back to my question. Can we have a rule against proprietary trading that in fact does not try to define every transaction as to whether it's a proprietary trade or not, which is not what the prospective rule did, but that's what it did in its caricature. Can we rely upon a broad understanding of intent and ex post review? This is not the only area in which this applies, but it's a very interesting area is to see whether in but fact- But this raises the question of the survivability, you know, of the, of the, of the rule, and I'm jumping over because I want to get the, the audience involved as well, those of you who have come, and I want to kind of pick up on the politics of it and, and, and hold off on some of the technical issues as, as well. But this is a rule that's got a lot of permitted activities, it's got a lot of prohibited activities. Uh, and, uh, and it certainly is, uh, I would call, hardly principles-based regulation. It's rules-based uh, well, reg regulation. There's a principle underlying it, for sure. But a lot of the people that I talk to are, and, and, and supporters of financial reform worry that, in fact, politically, the vocal rule is on some sort of a death march. And here's, their, here's sort of the list of their concerns. <laughs> Okay, uh, they, they, you know, for example, they will say, according to the, the, the Federal Reserve Bank's own uh, website, U.S. banks and their, uh, and their lobbyists uh, have held 21 meetings with Fed staff to discuss the rule and its uh, perceived uh, uh, deficiencies. This is totally lawful, of course. Uh, but these meetings have no doubt focused on the complexities and the economic costs involved and that uh, the rulemaking process is therefore getting bogged down in minutia and losing the big picture. B, uh, my friends will argue that this large document here uh, is seen as evidence of that bank lobbyists and complicit regulators and legislators have been successful in taking a rather simple idea, which is your idea, and bloating it into a hopeless complexity and vagueness rifled with loopholes and exemptions. And there are tons of exemptions that I can just list, and you can list as well. Uh, many banks in their January 13th, uh, 2012 comment letters uh, basically have commented on proposing a, uh, basically a uh, delaying the introduction of the rules pending better definitions and better clarity on the, on the rules. And I'm even beginning to hear chatter on Wall Street that the most aggressive actors in opposing the Volcker Rule namely the industry associations, and particularly I have in mind uh, CIF, uh, CIFMA, which is the Security Industries and Financial Markets Associations, are actually pursuing a subtle delay and repeal uh, uh, strategy. Is, do you feel this? I mean, is this a conspiracy theory out there, or do you feel this? And what is your prediction with respect to the future of the vocal rule in terms of the timing and the content of its implementation? It's alive, healthy, will be applied in a timely way. Uh, let me 
This process we're going through, it's a complicated one, it's important, uh, but it follows a normal procedure. The, you've got some unusual complexities here which you would rather not have. You've got, I think, six different agencies involved, depending upon who they regulate, plus the kind of oversight body located in the Treasury involving the same agencies with somewhat different authorities. And you've got a whole bunch of different institutions involved that are themselves operating under different laws in detail. So at the time you get all six or seven agencies and at least four or five different kinds of institutions, technically different institutions involved, you obviously have a compl complex rule. So the rule goes out, you get comments. One of the things I found a little odd, I must say, the day the rule went out, I think they published it on a, on a Friday, and it was six months, I think, to comment? Yes, right. Six months. You put on a rule on a Friday, you have six months on which to comment. I read in Monday's paper how three or four of the biggest law firms in the world put a special team of lawyers on it day and night over the weekend so that they could report to their principals how they wanted the thing changed by Monday morning. I mean, why are they, I mean, couldn't they have taken some sleep while they thought about this? I, I mean, why was it important to get something done on Monday morning when they had six months to, to think about it? I mean, it's just an illustration of the, the pressure that is put on here by the system. I'm not sure the banks were asking for that, but this is law firms competing with each other to who can say the most detail in the shortest possible period of time. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a ridiculous process and you probably aren't gonna get the most seasoned responses. In any event, they should have long, or they should have detailed responses. They took the six months. I suspect we will have, as a result of this, a better proposed regulation and a less detailed regulation, which will lean somewhat more toward the principal approach. I hope so. And people will find that less controversial. Then there was a provision in the law that you can have a two-year adaptation period, that as the regulation in the law is in effect, there'll be plenty of time to take account of obvious unintended consequences of which there always are some, overreach in this area, not enough reach in another area. And I see no reason why this won't be happily accommodated over a period of time. If it may, it may it, law goes into effect on July 12th, I think. If the regulation isn't quite finished by that time, that's not the end of the world. If it takes another month, it takes a few more weeks. There's no reason why that can't be accommodated uh, that I understand. So I think we're on a reasonable track in a different area. Now, let, in a different area. Now, let me point out what I think is the importance of this, which is too little emphasized. People say, oh, well, okay, was proprietary trading important in losses in banks? Well, the answer to that is yes. Was it the most important factor? No. The most important factor was making bad loans and bad real estate, and subprime mortgages and all the rest. That was not unrelated to proprietary trading because some of these CDOs, CMOs, and so forth were grist for the trading mill. What this does in a banking organization, in my opinion, creates an area of activity given inherently to big risk that changes the value system and the ethical environment within the bank. We're talking about ethics, right? This is a very risky, in itself, whether it brings down the bank, it is inherently risky activity, proprietary trading. And the equity funds and the hedge funds are another form of proprietary trading, basically. The equity funds, by their nature, creates conflicts of interest with the bank's customers. You cannot run an equity fund and run a hedge fund without advertently or inadvertently running into conflicts of interest with your borrowing customers. Is that what you want in the banking system? You've got lots of conflicts of interest anyway. These are unnecessary conflicts of interest. 
and to give rise to a compensation practice that is totally out of keeping with traditional compensation practices in banks that don't reward individuals massively for short-term trading profits. And if you're in a bank, a traditional bank, and you find some division of the bank is making, being compensated in a way that is beyond your wildest imagination of your normal expectations of what you'll be paid as a commercial banker, you begin thinking, how can I do some things that may be a little more risky we get the attention of management and I can claim special rewards that were beyond my expectations from these wonderful new activities that I'm thinking of, like subprime mortgages. Why have we been so careful in demanding 20% down and looking at somebody's credit standing when I can go out and buy mortgages from some broker who has no responsibility for the bank, for the mortgage, because he's gonna sell it to me right away. And we're gonna package them all up and because some financial engineers explained to us how to do this. And we put really bad mortgages together that look good. Uh, but it's even worse than that. <laughs> it's even worse than that. And, and I wanna open this up to, to discussions. It's even worse than that and we can talk about that later. But the compensation for the traders normally is based on the estimated future value of the trade. And the compensation is paid before the trade matures. Well, may or not, but I, it may have some right. so sting that's in its a, tail. You can, you can that's just a... guess what the behavior might be under those circumstances. Larry, I think we should take some questions Yeah, uh, from, the, from, the, from the audience. So first, um, our, our procedure is to send the mics out to the floor, so I will take a cue as I see it. Make sure you see me, see you, and we'll send the mic out to you. Um, but I'll ask the first question while I compile the cue. You were very generous, Mr. Volker, in your optimistic assumption about how the vocal rule were, will uh, mature. Uh, I, don't, I really think it's realistic. I... Okay. So I, I'm eager to understand whether you think that the policymaking process, which you've been very close to recently, as it involves the influence of lobbyists and the various industries, compares to the policymaking process, let's say the last time you were right at the center of government, which might have been um, during the uh, Carter and Clinton and, uh, and Reagan administration. Do, do, do you think it's the, it's the same process? Do you think it's gotten better? Do you think it's gotten worse? Do you think the role of uh, influence in the system has made it? In, in financial markets, I think there's no question it's gotten a lot more complex. Go back, which I may seem like ancient history to you, which seems pretty recent to me. You go back to the Latin American debt crisis in the early 80s. Investment banks then basically, well, they were partnerships, first of all. That changed their behavior pattern quite a lot because their own money was involved in the risks. And by and large, investment banks in those days was risk averse. And part of the reason they were risk averse is their own money was there, but part of the, one of the reflections of being risk averse was they did very little trading. They did underwriting. They sold securities on an underwriting basis, but they did not ordinarily trade back and forth as recently as, say, 1980. They, they began in the early 1980s. Then by the mid-1990s, they all became publicly owned, which changed between the trading mentality and the fact that their own capital was no longer at risk helped create a rather profound change in the behavior pattern. But this is the banks. What I'm asking about this is the is policy This is investment banks and right. I'm asking about the policy making process. Right. So you're meeting with senators and with representatives and you're trying to persuade them about what the right policy is. That process, is that process different from how it was? Well, I, I do think there's more money involved now. Look. <laughs> You may not think it's, this is a way to answer your question, but I think it's accurate. 
When I was in the Treasury in the 1960s, there was no luxury hotel in Washington. Mayflower existed there, but it was kind of run down. And the Shoreham was certainly run down. There was no modern hotel. There was one good French restaurant. There were a couple of steakhouses. And the population of Washington was, I don't know, 600,000 maybe. They had a few law firms. They probably had, what, 60 or 70 partners maybe, the biggest law firms in Washington. Go to Washington, D.C. now. The law firms have a whole block. I mean, they've got an office building that's a whole block. It isn't two floors in an office building. It's a whole damn office building. And it's probably half the office building in the next block. There were almost no trade associations in 1960 with offices in, certainly in the financial world. Savings and loans were in Chicago. The American Bankers Association was in New York. Uh, Missouri City Bankers Association were in New York. Now there is not a trade association that's not in Washington. Their headquarters are in Washington. And physically, you can see it. I mean, that's what's filling up all those office buildings in Washington. Probably the most prosperous city in the United States is Washington, D.C., with no manufacturing, no commercial business. Well, I can't say no commercial business. But there's something going on here that is representative of a lot more money and talent being put on the lobbying process than used to. Now, you can always argue, and frankly, that lobbying is just, you know, that's American. And every citizen has a right to lobby, and there's no doubt true. And you, you cannot put out a complication, complicated regulation much simpler than this one, but certainly this one, you want a response from the industry. You want a considered response. What is not particularly helpful is that the response goes with a big campaign contribution to the senator or the congressman. And that is what is happening on a scale that, you know, this is always campaign contribution, but it's happening on a scale now where the lobbying is combined with money to the extent, I think, that's just out of keeping with what it was even 20 years ago. Okay, Abby? Uh, so if you would just introduce yourself as you ask your question. Hi, my name is Abby Brown. I'm a fellow at the Safra Center. Over here. Yeah, um, I see you. And uh, I study auditors and financial fraud, and so I'm very interested in what you have to say. One of the things that um, I've been noticing a lot in my research is that people use notions of complexity and, and sophistication, and on the flip side, naivete, as weapons in arguing over financial regula regulation. I noticed in Mal's briefing memo to us that uh, Goldman Sachs was accusing you of being naive um, in your understanding of banking system. And I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on how people she's use sophistication. So great, that was, yeah, she's talking about the, that complexity uh, allows people, gives like, people license to, to gain. Pardon me? The complexity can give people right. license to gain. Well, the complexity, right. there's a complexity in the regulation, but there's complexity in markets. Right, but, but I'm, I'm interested in how people use complexity or additional unnecessary complexity as a weapon to uh, pull something over the regulators or their competitors' eyes. So the question is, are they using this complex, this concept of complexity as a way to make things more complex? So people are either in the know well, well, or you know, as Sometimes the effort to make it more, there's an effort to make it more complex for the sake of complexity. Yes. I don't think there's any question about that. Look, when you judge all these things, don't forget, I will have bankers come up to me practically every day. They are not the senior bankers who are lobbying Washington. They say, I like your rule. <laughs> you know, this is no unanimous opinion. Uh, I mean, the ones that are coming up to me are largely the ones who are more traditional bankers. But there is a sense that there's something the matter here. Uh, and, you know, one of the techni techniques to try to deal with it is to add complexity. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, and, you, you know, the regulators have the tough job of saying what, which of these pieces of complexity that are advanced are valid and which are not. And uh, I hope they begin a little more than in the past 
I don't talk to the regulators because I don't think that's probably, I don't talk to them about this anyway. And they've got to make up their own mind. And I think they have tried very hard to make a workable regulation. I am impressed, as a matter of fact, given all the lobbying there is on this, all the difficulties, the discipline, if that's the right word, that I have shown in testimony under constant assault from the committees, yes, Mr. Congressman, we think the thing is workable, we think we can manage this, we think we can deliver something reasonably on time that is workable. And uh, they've been pretty unanimous on that score. Right here. Uh, yeah, uh, Jed Schwartz from Somerville. The question has to do with uh, Rick Perry's concern. Uh, uh, you, can you hear me? Can, can, you, can you hear me, sir? This is, there's very bad acoustics in this room, so you need to speak very loudly into the mic. Uh, oh, so. okay. Uh, so uh, uh, the question has to do with Rick Perry, the, the, the candidate, concern about uh, uh, debate, uh, so-called uh, debasement of the currency. Uh, it has to do with quantitative easing by, by the Fed. Uh, now, uh, the, the basic, uh, my basic understanding, which I believe you would subscribe to, is that the, the Treasury Department auctions off Treasury notes to, uh, to, the, to the public and occasionally the Federal Reserve buys some portion of those Treasury notes. Uh, when it does so, uh, in, in large quantities, that's called quantitative easing. Uh, the, the question was whether the, the portion of, say, a monthly Treasury offering uh, bought by the Fed should affect interest rates. Because it's, it's, my impression has been that the, the, the rate uh, the, 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 the demand, the public demand for those treasury offerings in the past has determined the, the, the effective rate of return, the yield on the, yes. on the treasury notes. Well, uh, I, I, and, and I, the, I think the, I get the, the general gist of the question, and let me give you a relatively direct and short answer. The Federal Reserve has been buying a lot of treasury securities. In fact, they've been buying, in some months anyway, almost as much security and many securities as the Treasury's been issuing. They can't do it directly, but they do it in the market. Uh, that's all true. Does it affect interest rates? They hope so, that's for sure. Now, the short-term rate is already close to zero, so it doesn't have much effect. But they hope that it affects the longer-term interest rates, which they think is important for the economy. Now, the fact they are also very low, so it doesn't affect them all that much, but it does affect them. Uh, does this lead to inflation, which is your next question, I suppose? Uh, well, it could if they were not careful at the appropriate time to withdraw a lot of the money they're creating. Is it a technical problem? I don't believe so. I think they got the capacity to do this. Is this a tough, judgmental problem? Yeah, it's a tough, judgmental problem, but it's the same judgmental problem maybe increased in, uh, in directness that the Federal Reserve always has. Will they tighten up soon enough and far enough to prevent inflation before it gets underway? We won't know the answer to that question until it becomes a threat, and it's not a threat right now. But I, I think they will, but I, that is always a matter of judgment in the end. Questions about the back? Uh, hi there. Uh, David Lutton. I'm a visiting scholar at the Centre for European Studies. I wanted to get your thoughts on the results of the Vickers Commission in the United Kingdom. Which, the, what uh, question? the what question? The Vickers Commission. Oh, the Vickers, yes. Yeah, which, which deals with pretty much the same issue, but takes a different approach, a structural division, rather than a banning of actual activities. Well, it's interesting, the, the Vickers approach. I was kind of hoping they would adopt my approach, but they... <laughs> For some reason, maybe they will in the end. But for those of you who may or may not be familiar, the Vickers Commission, uh, accepted in principle anyway by the British government, uh, reflects the same concern that I have, and in a way, a more aggressive concern. They say commercial banks are really something special, and they should be protected rather directly and openly. Uh, but they should do what I say banks should be doing, what they say banks should be doing. They should be dealing with their customers, they should be lending them money, they should be keeping their deposits safe, they should be moving their money around. 
So we want to take, in a banking organization, we want to take those commercial banking functions and isolate them. And we'll take the rest of the banking organization, which is essentially an investment bank, and move it away from the commercial bank, and never will the two meet, except for some exceptions. So they will have complications, too. It all sounds very simple, but they're going to have big complications, too. Uh, in a way, they are restoring Glass-Steagall, but they're doing it with one organization. When you look at it, it's kind of easy to draw the conclusion. They would have rather said the bank ought to stand alone and these other activities ought to be different, done in different organizations entirely, but we think that's not politically practical, so we won't go that far right now. Uh, but they're after the same concern that we're after, that these proprietary-like activities, these speculative-like activities, ought to be removed from commercial banking. And that's a different way of doing it. We'll see. It's very interesting. You ask the banks, which would they prefer? <laughs> would they prefer the Volcker rule, or would they prefer Vickers? They both begin with V, so they've got something in common. <laughs> Uh, it's a question of which one they like least. Uh, and I don't know the answer. It's so right here. Uh, Mr. Volker, my name is Ben Bolger, and I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on some uh, policies that you advocated in the 1970s. We stepped away from a rela direct relationship between our money relating to gold. And I was wondering if you could uh, reflect on any unintended consequences that surprised you or have continued to surprise you as, as our policy has unfolded on that issue? Well, you're talking about the international monetary system now. We're gonna, That's right, the collapse of Br Bretton Woods. It's so quite forth. different subject. We used to promise foreign central banks they could exchange dollars for gold. We said, 1971, you can't do that anymore. Uh, we have had a lot of volatility in the exchange market since those days, a lot more volatility than we had back then. I don't think that's a good thing. But some people say, considering the alternative, we don't want to be in the kind of situation that the Greeks are in, I'm not talking about the United States, but any country, where maintaining a fixed exchange rate is forcing us into a deep-seated uh, depression in that case. So, uh, we haven't had the answer to this. I, I want to, we're roaming all over the place, but a big responsibility for the current crisis we're in, in my view, is a lack of international monetary discipline. What do I mean by that? We went through, roughly from 2000 to 2007, borrowing, as a country, increasing amounts from the rest of the world. Our own savings, personal savings, practically disappeared. We went on a big consuming binge. We went on a big housing binge. We went on a binge to run budget deficits, none of which we could afford domestically, so we borrowed a lot of money internationally. Now, you'd sat there and said in 2000, say the year 2000, by 2007, we're going to borrow three trillion dollars from the Chinese, you would have said you're out of your mind. Now, actually, we only borrowed about two trillion from the Chinese, they lent another trillion to somebody else. But we borrowed two trillion from the Chinese, a trillion from the Japanese, and you know, we were borrowing from, <laughs> we were borrowing from all those weak countries like Malaysia and Indonesia and Korea. Now, is that something that could last? I think the answer was evident. It could not last. Now, could you predict how it was going to collapse? Well, it all collapsed in, a, of all things, a housing crisis in the United States, because we were buying a lot of housing with 2% money from China, in effect. It's simplifying a bit, but it's not simplifying all that much. We had a financial, an international financial system that for all practical purposes had no discipline so far as the United States was concerned. And they gave us a lot of rope 
and we put it right around our neck, eventually to hang ourselves. Uh, and I'm making it a little over dramatic. We can still get out of it, but because there's still this faith and you know motherhood in the United States of America. But uh, this is a problem nobody really wants to deal with. The international monetary system since those days and the Bretton Woods system. And I think that's a big agenda on the international scene, but nobody wants to face up to it. Did you want to? Yeah, there's a big international question we haven't addressed with respect to the vocal rule, to bring it back you know, to, the, to the vocal rule. One of the exceptions in terms of proprietary trading is that, uh, is that banks, under the, under the jurisdiction of, of Dodd-Frank, in fact, uh, can, uh, uh, can proprietary trade in U.S. treasuries, municipals, government agencies, and, and the paper of Fannie and Freddie. And that, so they need, it's not just market making. They can actually speculate in these, uh, in these securities. And, uh, and by the way, these exclusions, okay, represent about 40% of the U.S. credit market. So uh, there's, it's a very, very large market that the banks are allowed to proprietary trade in for these credit instruments. What's happened now, as, we, as, as many of us know, is that, the far, is that foreign bankers and foreign governments are saying, whoa, wait a minute, why aren't we in there? Why can't, why can't the US banks proprietary trade in our government securities? And why can't we have the liquidity that the US uh, agencies have as well? And there's a lot, of, a lot of agitation about that. And how do you feel about that? I even hear, I hear rumors that bankers are going to go to the World Trade Organization and say it's some sort of a, I, mean, I don't get it myself, but that there's some sort of a, a restraint of, of trade issue here. But they're clearly very agitated about it. Can you speak to the fact that they're, yeah, well, that, that let, they're let, excluded and the US Treasury is yeah, Let me get to that. But let me just so you put this in perspective. This ban on proprietary trading, with some exceptions, applies to United States chartered banks and foreign banks to the extent they're operating in the United States, to their right. U.S. operations. Most of this, the only banks in the United States that do this in any volume, we're talking about four banks. That's right. the big ones. All this commotion is about four or maybe five banks. And the fourth and fifth aren't very important either, frankly. Uh, but, uh, so don't name them. <laughs> it's a very concentrated business. And in the old days, before uh, the investment banks became a bank, they did most of this. There's nothing to stop anybody else from trading in this stuff. All they want. The only thing that's prohibited is commercial banks. Now, why, what about this exclusion? I can't even remember when I originally proposed this whether I listed the exceptions that you say, but I probably did. But it would have seemed perfectly natural. Under Glass-Steagall, the old bill that didn't permit any participation exempted Treasury securities and exempted Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac because they were government agencies and they had a special status under the law. And there would have been an explosion going back to Glass-Steagall to exclude those. The Federal Reserve always had authority to buy and sell uh, Freddie Mac and, and Fannie Mae. I don't, it's not a good policy, and we didn't follow it when I was there, but it always had the authority. Now, right now, to take that part of the mortgage market is 90% Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. They are now government institutions. <laughs> I don't even know they are under government conservatorship. The whole mortgage market is dependent upon those institutions. That is wrong, in my view. But you can't get rid of it right now because there's no way. They are 40% of the capital market and we can't tomorrow say they can't operate. We wouldn't have any mortgage market at all. But over time, we ought to get rid of those. So that exception won't make any difference. Now, when you're talking about U.S. Treasuries, yeah. Uh, banks, to some extent, have always traded U.S. Treasuries. They do it under close surveillance. They're obviously safe. So you're going to take it for granted that they will be exempted. If you're going to exempt a foreign 
sovereign, you tell me how. We come back to that question I dealt with earlier. Canada wants to be exempted. I like to spend a lot of time in Canada. They've got good banks, stable economy, okay. Uh, but then Mexico wants to be. They're more dependent upon this trading than the Canadian economy is. So uh, we'll exempt Canada, we'll exempt Mexico. Oh, we can't exempt Mexico without exempting the UK and Germany, can we? I mean, those are good Anglo-Saxon type companies. And if we do two big countries in the European Union, well, obviously, we've got to do the other countries in the European Union. So we should announce right now to the American banks, you can go speculating Greek debt. Uh, I don't think we, I don't think that would be terrific policy, frankly, either now or in the future. So you make, you make some, right, it's not such an arbitrary distinction to say, U.S. government, okay, no other government. And once, doesn't mean we don't like them, we can continue to trade customer trade. We continue to make markets in Canadian debt, Mexican debt, and all the rest. Their banks, interestingly enough, do very little proprietary trading. Yeah, but what I hear from that, what I'm hearing, you know, in my ears, is that basically the exclusion is not extended to the uh, to the to to other sovereign uh, debt instruments because basically we don't feel that is as secure as the American no, our, securities. Is that, that's what I'm, I'm well, hearing. I, it's no, I, I it's think all I'm saying is very hard to draw the line between very those who are secure than aren't right. obscure, and they are not. You know, this story. I, there's a big problem here. But the story I hear that it's destroying their markets if Citibank, Morgan Chase, Bank of America, maybe Wells Fargo, cannot conduct proprietary trading. We're talking about proprietary trading. Right. Cannot de conduct proprietary trading, which they never do much anyway in those sovereigns, that those countries, their markets can't survive. I mean, it's. It's absurd on well, the face. Reverse the question. Reverse the question. Why do the European countries want to have their sovereign debt traded in a proprietary in a, in a proprietary way by Morgan and by J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs? Now there is a problem here. I think I don't know. I'm not an expert enough. But apparently, the law says, understandably, American banks cannot do proprietary trading. Foreign banks, subsidiaries operating in the United States cannot do proprietary trading. Foreign banks outside the United States can do what they want to do. So long as, and they write this in law, so long as they are not, in effect, trading with Americans, and they just move the operation overseas. They can do all the proprietary trading they want in their own securities. They can do all the proprietary trading they want with Americans, so long as it's customer trading. So what are we excluding? Nothing, practically, for them. Now, there apparently are, this gets very technical, and I can't tell you all the technicalities, that the law is written, the regulation is written so tightly that some of the foreign banks, and particularly the Canadian banks, complain, the way you've written the law, we can't do an ordinary business in Canada in our own trading because all these trades, because of the nature of the New York market, they're all finally settled in New York. And if the law is interpreted, this is, uh, I don't think it's a regulation, if the law is interpreted that we can't settle trades in Canada through the mechanics of the New York market, no American is involved except in the mechanics, we can't operate. If that's true, I don't know if it is true, but they think it's, they argue it's true, that has to be, that's why you have comment on the regulation to take care of that kind of problem, which certainly is not intended. Uh, so I think they, you know, they may have had a legitimate complaint. That's a technical complaint. They ought to come make the complaint and it ought to be repaired. Do so you have a question right here? Hi, my name is Megan Duffield, and my question for you is, 
Um, I understand that banks should be behaving better and the regulation that you're proposing. However, um, if you look at the fundamentals of the issue, would you not agree that moral hazard is giving them the opportunity to behave this way in the marketplace? So like your comments on moral hazard in general, that there's an elastic currency that exists to allow them to put forth the operations that they have. Well, if I understand the question, let me answer it this way. We've done a lot of talking about this little innocent Volcker rule, extremely easy to implement uh, in general. The two, I'll give you two more important provisions of Dodd-Frank. One is the regulations on derivatives, which are more fiercely contested, I believe, than the regulation on proprietary trading. I refer to this $700 trillion worth of derivatives I've seen. That's not all American banks. But the effort in Dodd-Frank and every, everybody was widely accepted that there ought to be better arrangements and safer arrangements for the clearance and transactions and derivatives. The law requires that as far as it can go. But to have that kind of clearance and clearance houses, the derivatives have to be more standardized. And frankly, the banks want to standardize them as little as possible because they make a bigger profit margin when they're not standardized. But the question is whether the non-standardized ones should be as important as they would like them to be. Now, on the moral hazard question, and this all relates to moral hazard, Dodd-Frank, and you could argue this is the most important provision, says, it says in English, an important financial institution, failing financial institution, shall be liquidated. Now, by liquidated, it means literally liquidation, you know, it goes through some kind of a bankruptcy process, and the piece is sold off, or it could be merged, or it could be sold to somebody else. But that institution will no longer exist, its stockholders will lose, the management is out, and its creditors are at risk. Now, the law says, because you don't want disruption that I tried to avoid before, is that bankruptcy law will be amended so that the U.S. government, in the form of the SBIC, can jump in at the point of failure, and they'll operate the bank or the other financial institution long enough to get it liquidated in an orderly way. That's a pretty direct provision. And it really says in black and white, it says <laughs> the US government cannot lend to one of those institutions except when it put it in receivership uh, or in the conservatorship. There's a lot of skepticism about it's workable. And everybody sits back and says, ah, oh, I know that's what the law says. But when push comes to shove, they won't do it. They will be, just as they wanted to protect the creditors this time, just as they wanted to protect the stockholders this time, and the stockholders were always protected. They lost a lot, but they were always protected except in Lehman. They'll do it again because they'll be frightened of the, of the side effects of the contagion. So it's interesting how little discussion there is of this provision, although arguably it's the most fundamentally important provision in the whole bill. Basically because people say, well, I know this there, but it's not workable. In fact, I do not think it is workable for a big institution that is international, strongly international, as these big banks are, without a kind of uniform approach by other countries. And the country that really matters here is the UK because by all odds, the extent American banks are operating abroad, 90% of what they do abroad is probably in the UK, and the rest of it doesn't matter very much, or it's in countries that are easy. So you have to have some agreement with the UK on this. And it's interesting, I don't think people realize it's a lot of work going on between the UK and the American regulators with a common purpose. And it's slightly different laws, or they have different laws, but they, both laws are adaptable to the conservatorship liquidation approach. 
And they're working very hard, it's very detailed, but at least they're working together to try to make this provision workable, even for big institutions. The other part of the law says the institutions themselves have to conduct their operations in a way that discrete parts of the bank can be broken off and sold. You've got to make a so-called living will. And our trading operation has to be in this pocket and our uh, investment management's in another pocket and our traditional commercial banking's in another pocket except foreign operations are separate from domestic operations and so forth. That's what the banks are supposed to do. They have to present these living wills to the regulators, I forget just when, and by the middle of the year, I think they're supposed to present their plans. And it'll be interesting to see how many do, or, or the plans go beyond you know, some <laughs> incidental operation that they say, okay, that's a special operation we can sell off. Uh, and this is a more fundamental part of the bill than than proprietary trading. It's interesting, one other word in defense, that, you know, with some limited, some de minimis exceptions, hedge funds and equity funds are gone from bank sponsorship and ownership. And my sense is it's been, they don't like it, but there are relatively few complaints about that. And that process is going on now, that they are doing whatever is necessary now you can still put their customers into a hedge fund or into an equity fund, but they can't run and manage the hedge fund. And since this is a big source of conflicts of interest, I think that's generally recognized that this is a useful prohibition. Except for Morgan Stan uh, JP Morgan is, is irate about that. But, but one thing that relates to your point that's very interesting, you look at the banks that have basically closed down way in advance, you know, their proprietary trading, you can say, isn't that wonderful? I'm enough of a cynic to understand, first of all, they've done it because some, uh, in Goldman's case, a lot of their traders have defected and gone to Hong Kong to set up. But more importantly, my hypothesis on this one who would be that the reason why they've gotten out of proprietary trading so early is because in the last 18 months they're making no money. Well, I think and they're that's... Happy, and they're happy to get out of proprietary trading. I think that is trading. unduly cynical. I think they've gotten out of it because they know that part of the law is black and white, yeah. and they're going to have to get not, out of it. They're not making any money right now. Okay, so we have a simple rule that yep. time begi the <laughs> session begins on time and the session's going to end on time. So I'm going to enforce that simple rule and thank both Mal and Mr. Thank Volker so for participating. You. you are really cynical. I was, I